Double the roundup because I've been laggy the last few months. I'm working on it, I promise. Okay, I'm at a loss for words because this movie is legit puzzling. It doesn't really have a story. Merlin starts educating a young boy for most of the movie and then accidentally becomes king within the last five minutes like it's no big deal. Like, this movie's so much nothing. A lot of Disney movies amount to nothing, but they usually at least have something resembling a plot and a climax. This one just stops and... I'm a little fascinated how this movie came to be made. Merlin's funny, but you can't really base an entire movie around that one idea. It's a nothing plot and furries. I just... I don't get it. Like, Walt, well, this movie's a dud. It really needs a life-saving injection of gay princesses. Okay, I'll level with you. I didn't finish the Jungle Book. I got 20 minutes into the movie, and I had only three jokes written, and I decided I just couldn't be bothered finishing it. I don't know what it was about the movie that made me so criminally bored, but I couldn't stand watching another minute. Something, something gay princesses. This whole movie is about one alley cat trying to get laid and become a stepfather. The Aristocats is aged weirdly. The film has the worst of the worst when it comes to Disney racism. Every single one of the alley cat gang is a racial stereotype, but special mention goes to the one cat with squinty eyes, buck teeth, and English accent and can't string sentences together. They even had him play the Oriental riff on a piano with a pair of chopsticks just to really hammer it home. Here's the thing that bothers me about Disney racism, you know, aside from the fact that it's racism. People are always trying to excuse Disney's racist crap by saying, Oh, it was a different time time. Standards were different back then. But the thing is, that only really applies to nomenclature. Depending on the time period, it's not uncommon to hear some of the lesser racial slurs being used, but the kind of depictions that occur in a lot of Disney films, and this one in particular, only happens when you have a particularly nasty kind of malice that can exist regardless of the time period it came from. A lot of people from that time were racist simply because racism was normalized, but it took a particular kind of racism to do something like a minstrel show or protest interracial marriage, an antagonistic kind of racism, the MAGA kind of racism. And Disney very much falls into that category because there is nothing about their depictions that isn't completely and 100% deliberate because no amount of passive racism is going to get you this far. This is why I reject the notion that I have to judge it based on the time in which it was released because this kind of shit was antagonistic even by the standards of its time. Anyway, moving on to what has arguably aged the best, I was honestly surprised by Thomas O'Malley. Usually male leads in Disney films are either bland or blatantly horrible because the idea that male leads don't have to be entitled selfish, low-key, misogynistic jackasses is actually a relatively new thing, as in within the last decade or so, and only two characters ever really fit that role. Well, now it's three because, honestly, O'Malley fits into that same mold. In fact, you know who he most reminds me of? Eugene in the first season of the Tangled cartoon, where he was really understanding about Rapunzel's refusal of his proposal, had no hang-ups about Rapunzel's ability to take care of herself, and even chided the king himself over it. Eugene, please, take care of Rapunzel. We are gonna get you out of here. Besides, you should know by now, Rapunzel doesn't need anyone to take care of her. And was just overall the most supportive, understanding kind of person around. And that's the same kind of vibe I get from O'Malley. While he starts the movie trying to flirt with Duchess, who honestly flirts back even harder, almost instantly he switches to caring only about her well-being over himself, and it's just... Nice. I know it's kind of a bare minimum standard for these kind of characters, but I'm just going to appreciate that this managed to happen in the 70s of all things. I know Lady and the Tramp kind of went that way too, but Tramp only really turned around in the last bit of the movie, while O'Malley is like that almost immediately after he's introduced. Everything else in the movie is usually centered on the relationship between Duchess, her kids, and O'Malley, and it's a miracle that O'Malley came out as well as he did. I'm in two minds on this movie because on the one hand, it has some of the worst racism I've ever seen in Disney, but on the other hand, O'Malley himself has aged surprisingly well. Then again, maybe there's something else problematic about this movie that I'm missing, because I'm still dealing with the whole sheltered in rural Canada thing, and someone else will point it out to me in the comments and I'll kick myself for not noticing. I mean, personal growth and further enlightening is almost as good as gay princesses. I was genuinely surprised by Robin Hood. I expected it to be the usual snore fest a lot of these movies are, but it was a genuinely funny and enjoyable movie, which is ironic considering it's about a rich oligarch choking the life out of the general public with crippling taxes. This is the fun part of reviewing movies by today's standards rather than the standards of when they came out, because this film came out just before Reagan gutted the American economy to heavily favor the rich more than it already had done, so the idea of a greedy baron as the villain who just wants gold, gold, gold was seen as quaint back in the 70s, and still is by people who live in their own fantasy land, but today, when Amazon and employees are living off food stamps while their CEO is sitting on almost $200 billion, I'm not the first person to point out that the lol so greedy corporate villain from a lot of movies isn't exactly the cartoon caricature people like to imagine they are, that's actually how corporate executives work. And in Robin Hood it gets more on the nose, because just like in the movie, when the rich are encountered with anything that might make them go from extremely rich to ever so slightly less extremely rich, they go... <laughs> 
In the first third of the movie, there's an extended scene where a bunch of children sneak into Prince John's castle only for Maid Marian and... I don't remember who the chicken's name is, to welcome them in and act out the overthrow of Prince John. Aside from the fact that it's beautifully relevant these days to hear a child scream death to tyrants, especially since these days that has somehow become a contentious topic, the whole sequence is probably the most adorable thing I've ever seen in a Disney movie. Seriously, that kid's going places. Also, the brawl after the archery tournament remains one of the single funniest things I've ever seen in one of these movies. The slapstick, to the quipping, to the football homage out of fucking nowhere, it's just a good time. And after spending so long having to slog through so much horrible shit out of professional obligation, I am all about having a good time. Robin Hood is a great film. It's aged beautifully, and it stands out against an ocean of centrist live-and-let-die complacency. Only thing that can make it truly perfect is gay princesses. Oh boy, this month was kind of a... Uh... We're getting close to a series of movies that are hard to talk about. The Jungle Book was one, and The Rescuers is another. I didn't even make it in a minute about The Rescuers, and it's for the simple fact that the sheer amount of child abuse in this movie wasn't something I could make a joke about. It made me physically uncomfortable. The Rescuers is a beautiful movie, and a very well-written movie, but it's not something that can or should be joked about. I... I don't want to talk about this movie, to be honest. It's good, but it makes me very uncomfortable, and I really don't want to watch it again. Not even if it had gay princesses. Good lord, this movie shit. The Fox and the Hound is remembered as this sad movie about a pair of best friends who were driven apart by society, but that friendship only lasts for about two days before Copper gets put on a bus and comes back an old and hardened hunting dog. It's probably the least emotionally gripping friendship ever put on screen, and the fact that the movie treats it like they've been close friends forever is laughable. And that's ironic because there's a much more emotionally compelling relationship between Todd and his human caretaker, who raised him since he was a baby. There's actually a scene where she has to drop him off at a game preserve to keep him safe from Mr. Republican, and it's really sad because she's saying goodbye to someone she raised for years, and I'm baffled as to why as soon as it's over, we get back to the supposed tragedy of Todd and Copper's barely existent friendship. I know they imply there was a big time skip, but the point where Copper goes off hunting is when he's still just a little pupper, and the final act is stretched on extremely long. I just don't care. I can't be fucking bothered with this movie because it already showed me what the movie actually was. Ironically, if you stop the Fox and the Hound after they first meet, then watch all of the Fox and the Hound 2, and then continue Fox and the Hound afterward, their friendship actually has a lot more going for it. I know some people look at that movie and go, it misses the point of the original, but honestly, I think it just reinforces it. I ever forget that again? You just kick me on my walking away end. <laughs> Shake on it. <laughs> Shake on it. <laughs> We're still friends, aren't we? Todd, those days are over. The whole point of The Fox and the Hound is that society is going to tear their friendship apart. Is an additional movie entirely about that friendship really a bad thing? I think the reason a lot of people have a bug up their ass about the sequel is because... Well, because Lindsay Ellis told them to have a bug up their ass about it, but also because it doesn't carry the same moody tone since it's a movie about Babouge being fringe. But that's the point of a mid -quel. It complements the original story, and the original story really fucking needed it. This turned into me talking about The Fox and the Hound too, didn't it? I think in general, the film suffers from skipping to adulthood too soon and staying there for way too long, so it ends up being like, wait, friendship? What friendship? But maybe that's just my bias for cute Babouge being fringe. Copper, you're my very best friend. Mine too, Todd. Good exchange, movie. Admittedly, this movie is pretty gay. I mean, look at that look they give each other. That's the look I give my girlfriend. Actually, that's also the look I give my best friend. How does love work? Whatever. Five out of ten needs more gay princesses. The Black Cauldron is... I don't know, another five out of ten? It's gained something of a cult following in recent years due to it supposedly being a more dark and mature animated feature, and incidentally, cult is exactly the right word for the kind of people who flock to dark cartoons, but the movie itself is just an even-toned, okay movie. This is the part of the roundup that's really draining on me, because a lot of these movies are just okay. They're not great, they're not great balls of shit, they're just alright, and that leaves me with very little to say about them. I'm glad the Disney Renaissance is coming around soon, because those movies are at least interesting to talk about, even if they are talked about to death. This movie isn't remembered for a reason, because it's just a straight fantasy that feels like it would have felt right at home in a bookstore among the piles of unsold fantasy books that did nothing different or interesting because they were too scared to break from tradition. They need to make another one where Alonwi drops the pig farmer and gets herself a girlfriend because these movies desperately need gay princesses. I don't like Sherlock Holmes stories. They just never interested me. Detective stories, sure, but Sherlock Holmes and thinly veiled spin-offs or homages to Sherlock Holmes? Not so much. 
I don't know, maybe it's because that one BBC show was all over the internet for a while and became part of this trifecta of TV shows whose fan base was the single most obnoxious group of antisocial malcontents ever witnessed by human eye. But honestly, I'll take hyperactive 14-year-olds over the kind of willfully blind psychopaths who still defend Steven Ubermensch. You can tell I don't actually know how to introduce The Great Mouse Detective. The movie's actually really good, but it's got that problem where the story is told in clusters and a lot of interesting things happen at certain points of the story and the spots in between are just really dull. As a result, the story looks like a badly laid out Frostpunk city. Radigan is probably one of the most enjoyably evil villains in all of Disney's library. Just the way he talks about how he's got to kill Basil in particular is probably some of the most delightfully evil voice acting I've ever seen. I'm not looking forward to the live action remake of this where they change Radigan's backstory to be about how a friend moved away when he was little and that's why he tried to stage a coup and create a totalitarian state in Britain before Basil talks him down and they cry it out. I can't wait for the current era of animation to be over. This is where I'm in a bind though because as much as I love this movie, I never want to watch it again. And can you really say a movie is good if that's the caveat? A lot of these movies have that caveat where with the exception of Robin Hood, I never really want to watch any of them again. They're good movies, I'm glad I saw them, but I can't see myself owning them on Blu-ray. And Great Mouse Detective is definitely one of those movies. I'm glad to just be able to cross it off the list of Disney movies I've never seen. I mean, maybe if it had gay princesses. We're two for two on pre-Renaissance Disney movies I actually owned as a kid that still held up. The first was Robin Hood, and now we have Oliver and Company. Full disclosure, I never read Oliver Twist, and I know absolutely nothing about what happens in it. While Robin Hood saw a spike in relevancy with its talk about the rich exploiting and sucking the life out of the poor and screaming death to tyrants, which is apparently a bar that animation today doesn't seem to want to cross. Stop being evil, Mr. Not Hitler. Okay. I am a good guy now. Okay, I believe you. And over here, Oliver and Company is this heartwarming story about a poor gang dropping everything to make a little rich girl happy. That might be a tad reductionist. I love this movie because it's got a really simple plot, but it's really soft. I've been kind of starved for wholesome content the last few years, so much so I end up having to make it myself. So it's nice to still have films to turn back to that are so delightfully sweet. I can't think of a single character in this movie I don't like. I even like Roscoe and DeSoto, even though I'm pretty sure I'm not supposed to. Though as much as I love Georgette for her attitude, I'm a little troubled by how she's animated. Someone on the animation team really wanted to fuck that dog, to the point that I think she ripped off her own fur at some point. The internet has kind of desensitized me to that though. It's a meme at this point that people want to fuck the Eldritch Abomination thing from Pokemon, and I'm pretty sure that's the only reason Venom made any money, so it's clear that the animal fucking fandom isn't going anywhere. Why did I make a whole tangent about furries? Right, because this movie doesn't actually have much to talk about. It's a very simple story, and that's why it's good. You can't really fuck up with simple stories, and I think that's why it remains such a memorable and fun movie. It just needs some gay princesses. Anyway, I'll see you guys next month, where we cover the four movies that people consider to be untouchable classics. Joy! Joy.